suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. Let the AMA and the APA note. We do not wish to imply that all psychiatrists are heavies, nor that psychoanalysis is nonsense. Without psychotherapy, a lot of us would be dead, or worse, so sick that death itself would be a welcome surcease. So listen then, listen to Head Shrinker, starring Miss Nina Fosh and Mr. Helmut Dantine, which begins in just a moment. Come on and go, go, go in a Plymouth, a go-kart through and through. You really go, go, go for a Plymouth, and Plymouth will really go for you. Fifteen minutes behind the wheel. That's all it takes to convince you that the 59 Plymouths really got it. Got the newest of new design, new sport car handling ease, new fury performance, new get up and go. Just tell your Plymouth dealer you want to sample the go. Then you turn the key and Plymouth's new Golden Commando V8 leaps into life. Now you just push a button and go on your way to the most fun-filled 15 minutes of your driving life. See your Plymouth dealer. Take your fun drive in the 59 Plymouth real soon. You really go, go, go for a Plymouth, and Plymouth will really go for you. And now, Head Shrinker, starring Miss Nina Fosh and Mr. Helmut Dantine. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. The doctor will see you now, Mrs. Ellender. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm his last appointment. <laughs> As usual, Mrs. Ellender. Uh, I'll be leaving shortly myself. As usual. Thank you. As usual. Hmm. Well, how are you this afternoon? All right, I guess. The couch, or, or may I sit down? The couch, I think. Your associations seem to flow more freely on the couch. All right. You're the doctor. I said you're the doctor. I heard you. Well, that's supposed to be funny. Is it? Well, you laughed the first time I said it. The first day I came here. I laughed to put you at your ease. I had uh, heard it before. <laughs> You've heard everything before, haven't you, Doctor? Does it seem that way to you? Everything but this. What? I'm going to kill you. When? Before this hour is over. Why? Oh, look at your notes, Doctor. You've taken any notes while you've been scratching away behind me all these months? I don't know, maybe you've just been doodling. Maybe you're drawing pictures. Yeah, that's probably it. Dirty pictures. That must be quite a file you have on me. Ruth Ellender, manic, depressive, compulsive, obsessoid, check and double check neurotic. How long have I been turning myself inside out for you? How long have I been doing my psychic striptease for you? How many hours have I spent on this couch? How many? You know as well as I. Oh, no, I don't. Once I knew the time of day. Once I knew how many days it was until Christmas, I could tell when the rent was due, give or take a day or two. I could, I could place myself in time fairly well. No longer. Now there is no time. Now there's nothing but 5 o'clock to 5.45 every afternoon, Monday through Friday, the other 23 hours and 15 minutes of the day. I don't know where they go. Saturday and Sunday. What do you suppose happens to me on Saturday and Sunday, dear, dear doctor? This is a phase of the treatment. Oh, yes, I know, I know. Transference, it's called, to be followed by counter-transference, and when that's completed, I'll be a whole person. But hasn't that transference gone a little bit too far? I don't know any place where Freud suggests the weekend is a particularly effective time for transference. No quiet, out-of-the-way resource is a substitute for the doctor's office. You shouldn't be reading Freud. I know I should just take your word for it. 
If I went to the great man himself, I might find out what a swindler you are. What happened to those weekends, Werner? What happened to the Saturdays and Sundays of my transference? Am I now to expiate your sins in the agony of solitary counter-transference? Each patient requires his own kind of treatment. And some other patient needs the weekends. Is she as pretty as I am? As intelligent? As sick? If uh, you are dissatisfied with the progress of your therapy, you are free to quit at any time. Quit? Oh, no, Werner. I can't quit. You know I can't quit. I love you, Werner. Heaven help me. I love you. In a moment, we continue with the second act of... Suspense. What bothers you most about a cold? For me, it's the choked-up congested feeling. In fact, science now says to clear away most cold miseries, clear away congestion. Sinus congestion that causes headaches. Nasal congestion that shuts off breathing. Throat phlegm with its choking discomfort. Bronchial irritation that starts coughing. Yes, to clear away those cold miseries, clear away that congestion. And now, there's a specialized new medicine to do that fast. Four-way liquid cough and cold medication. Taken as directed, with the first dose, feel sinus pressure and headache clear. Feel runny nose dry and open up. Breathe freely. Sore throat is soothed and cough eased. Yes, four-way liquid clears away cold congestion and clears away worst cold miseries. Working through the bloodstream, it reaches all those congested areas. Because it's liquid, relief comes fast. So to clear away cold suffering, clear away congestion with new four-way liquid cough and cold medication. Get it today, only 98 cents. And now, starring Miss Nina Fosh and Mr. Helmut Danteen, Act Two of Head Shrinker. Love. I said I loved you. What is love, Doctor? What is it to you? What is it to me? What is it to me? Always you answer a question with a question. There was a Greek who did that once. Socrates. That's right. You're a lot like him, Doctor, and you know what happened to him. And why? Aren't you projecting? Projecting? I gave up little boys when I stopped being a little girl. You were speaking of love. I was a little girl once. Seems strange, but I was. I was Daddy's little girl. I'd run down the walk to meet him in the late afternoon, screaming, Daddy's home. Daddy, Daddy's home. He'd sweep me up in his arms and kiss me. My cheek would be all scratchy against mine. My mustache would tickle. <laughs> and he smelled funny. But nice. Sweaty and sweet, bitter breath of a pipe smoker, the smell of a man. <laughs> we had so much fun together. In the evenings, I would curl myself up in his lap while he was reading the paper. He never minded a bit. And on Saturdays, when it was raining, I'd hang around his workbench in the garage while he was building something. Sawdust and wood shavings. Well, their man smells too, you know, Daddy. Daddy, 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 dear Daddy. Daddy, you know what I'd like to do next Saturday? I'd like to go to the beach with you. Will you take me, Daddy? Please take me. Will you? We'll go down early in the morning. We'll stay all day and we'll have lots and lots of hot dogs. And... Oh, no, Daddy, just you and me. We don't want Mother along. Why did it stop? Why did it have to stop? Why can't I sit in your lap anymore, Daddy? Why? Why, Daddy? Why, Daddy? Daddy? Why? Here. Why can't I, sit I will give in you your... something to quiet you. I don't want any of your shots. I don't need your fancy magic medicine with the unpronounceable name. I want my Daddy. 
I want it to be like it was before. Before? I want it to be like... Before I was 11 or 12. Before he changed. It changed suddenly, you know, all at once. He wouldn't let me curl up on his lap anymore. He'd push me and tell me I was a big girl now. He'd act embarrassed as if he were almost ashamed of me. Probably not ashamed, but uh, certainly embarrassed. You were growing up. I didn't want to grow up. I didn't ask to grow up. I wanted to be Daddy's little girl. That's all I ever wanted. I want all those boys in school. And later, I smelled like milk. Milk to the turning sour, not pipes and sawdust and sweat. My cheeks weren't scratchy. They were just boys. Yet you married one of them. Well, yes, I knew I'd marry him from the moment I met him at that party during the Christmas holidays. We started going around together once a week, then twice a week, and soon we were seeing each other every night. And then he would call me his princess. And he was my knight on a white horse. And we were married in... In church, I was a June bride, and Daddy gave me away. And then I was Mrs. George Ellender. I wasn't a princess anymore, and George wasn't a knight on a white horse. It wasn't like the fairy stories, so they lived happily ever after. Those stories don't tell about the sinks full of dirty dishes. They make no mention of the sleep smell of the dawn embrace or the painful tedium of getting to know someone after you're married to him. But we made it all right. We got through that first year. We played house. I called him daddy and he called me mommy. He thought it was fun. Well, it was fun. But you changed all that. You awakened me. You taught me reality. You opened my eyes, you and your psychoanalysis why couldn't you have left me alone? Why didn't you let this sleeping bitch lie? Who do you think you are, God? No, but perhaps you think I am. Oh, no, 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 not God. The devil, maybe, but not God. Anthropomorphism, the last refuge of the ignorant and the immature. Oh, come off those big words. They don't impress me anymore. Save them for your next victim. Victim? Yes, victim. Lawyers have clients, storekeepers have customers, doctors have patients, but you have victims. Why me, though? Why should you pick on me? There were other women at that party where we met. Lots of them. Nice, juicy, neurotic ones. Why me? You sought me out. Oh, come now. Who lit the cigarettes? Who brought the drinks? Who danced attendance and, and, and who told me I was more disturbed than I realized? The fantasies of rationalization. The distinguished psychiatrist. The great healer. Concerned with poor little me. The beard. Like a messiah. The gentle voice. With just enough of Vienna in it. The compassionate eyes. I arrived at that party in the best of health. I left it a very sick woman who could be made well only by you. You convinced me that I was leading a meaningless life, that I was unhappy and maladjusted and immature. You assured me that I would only realize my fullest potential through psychoanalysis. You practically begged me. No. You seduced me into becoming your patient. You came here of your own free will. Oh, no, I came here of your will. And against my husband's. It's only natural for a husband at first. At first! George didn't have a chance. You saw to that. You tore him down piece by piece until there was nothing left of him or our marriage. Your decision to divorce your husband was arrived at by you after you realized the real reasons why you married him. Oh, nuts! I've been on this couch too long for that kind of double talk, Werner. You guided my free association every inch of the way. You led me, oh, so deftly to the water. And then you let me think it was my idea to drink. That first night when you took me to dinner, 
I didn't know then. How could I? That no ethical analyst would have suggested such a thing. I thought it was part of the therapy. Oh, I was so easy for you, wasn't I, Werner? It must have been very little fun for you, really. No struggle. Poor Werner, I took away your sense of conquest, didn't I? But I gave you everything else. Everything. Willingly. I loved you, Werner. You were a god. My god. Your pipe, your your beard. You were Daddy. What a contemptible thing to say. What an evil, dirty man you are. You see why it has become impossible for you to continue as my patient? Yes. I told you when I became your lover that I could no longer be your doctor. And you were right. And so that's the last time I will ever lie on that couch. From this moment on, I shall no longer be your patient, and you will no longer be my doctor. A very mature decision. Yes, because now I'm going to kill you. moment, we continue with the third act of Suspense. Once upon a time, the man with the fastest horse was the best newsman. Those were the days when everything traveled slowly and just getting the news through it all was an accomplishment. The fabulous progress in radio communications has changed all that. Today, we can hear what's happening anywhere within moments of the event itself. And with this change has come a new criterion for good news reporting. Swift communications aren't enough. How good is the man at the mic? What can he tell us of why the event took place? The meaning of the event in our own lives? Its meaning elsewhere in the world? Those are the questions we want answered now. And those are the questions distinguished CBS newsmen are eminently qualified to answer. CBS newsmen are more than widely traveled news reporters. They are men with thoughtful, probing minds that are put at your service. Every news service has fast horses these days, but only CBS News has men like these reporting to you regularly, bringing you more than the facts, helping you to understanding. And now, starring Miss Nina Fosh and Mr. Helmut Danteen, Act Three of Head Shrinker. That gun is loaded. Do you think I'm just acting out my aggressions? I'm not that sick, dear doctor. The gun is loaded. You have considered the uh, consequences? All of them. If uh, you take my life, society will take yours. They won't get the chance. There's another bullet in this gun. There are several. I could ring for help. Go ahead. You'll be dead when it gets here. You are quite determined to kill me? Quite. Do you feel qualified to judge, condemn, and execute another human being? As qualified as any other woman who's been rejected by the man she loved and found him not worth her loving. But I don't hate you as much as I loathe myself for having loved you. I see you now for what you are. A ridiculous little man. I wonder how you'd look without that beard. I wonder if you have any chin under it. Don't you think this uh, comedy has gone far enough? It is a comedy, isn't it? And you're the comedian. The apostolic descendant of Sigmund Freud. From all our sins, dear Freud, deliver us. Thy will be done. Deliver us not into our it, and forgive our ego. For thine is the power and the superego forever and ever. And little bearded Werner is thy vicar on earth. You are becoming hysterical. Now, put that gun away and uh, get a hold of yourself. Uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm enjoying our little comedy. And my hour isn't over for 12 more minutes. It is my hour. I'm paying for it. You're insane. Uh-uh. Insane is a legal term, not a psychiatric term. Remember, we learned that early on the couch. There is no such thing as insanity. Only varying degrees of adjustment to reality. There, see how well I learned my lesson? But there's so much more I don't know. For instance, Doctor, 
I've often wondered why you chose psychiatry as your specialty. I've always been interested in the human mind. Honestly? Yes, how it works. Why people do the things they do. Our number one problem in this country is mental health. Yes, I know. And you're dedicated to combat this scourge at $20 an hour. That is not an exact... It's quite a racket. All that money. Plus the innermost secrets of some of the town's most prominent men and women. The ethics of my profession... Were you ethical with me? Ruth, please try to understand me. You were not just a patient. You were so much more to me. You made me a man. I know. So you told me. But you didn't tell me about the one before me. The one who tried to commit suicide after you refused to continue therapy. Um, I've been doing a little checking. It's very interesting the things you hear around town when your name is mentioned. You know, Werner, you aren't very highly thought of in this community. What do you mean? I'm surprised no one has named you as co-respondent in a divorce case yet. How many of your patients stay married after you're through with them? What is it you have against marriage, Werner? I can't be responsible for what a person does once he learns the truth about himself. Of course you can't. A surgeon can be held responsible if he leaves a pair of pliers inside a patient after an operation. An obstetrician could be held responsible for a bungled delivery. But you can't be sued for a ruined life. It's a great out you have. The patient did it himself. Name me one patient you've made happy. Psychoanalysis does not guarantee happiness. No, you tell me. It seeks to help the individual to adjust to reality. There is no such thing as happiness. That's not what you said once. There is only the absence of angst. <sighs> Translation, please. Angst, anxiety, fear. A person can function normally only when he has rid himself of fear. What are you afraid of, Werner? Me? Why, nothing. Then why do you hide behind that beard? Why, I... Aren't you afraid to look like other men, lest people realize that's all you are? Just another man. No, no, of course not. Why do you use your analyst couch as a lonely hearts club? Can't you meet women any other way? Are you afraid to compete with other men in the world of women? Ruth. Ruth, don't say things like that. Why? Because they're true? Are you afraid of the truth, Werner? Of reality? Ruth. You said you loved me once. So I did. And you said you loved me. And I believed you. But now I know you didn't love me. You hated me. You hate all women. And you hate the happiness they can bring to a man. So you try to destroy love wherever you find it. You aren't an evil man, Werner. You're a sick man. I know I am. But what can I do? I sit here all day long, listening to the deepest problems of others, but, but who can I turn to with my problems? Forgive the bad joke, Werner, but what you need is to be psychoanalyzed. I was, you know that. Then you need a refresher course. No, Ruth. I need you. Me? Yes. Oh. You. You know all about me. You understand me. <laughs> I need your help, Ruth. Help oh, me, Ruth. No, Please. no, Werner, no, no. You must help no. me, Ruth. Please help me. You seem to forget that I came here to kill you. But you didn't really mean it. You were acting out your aggressions through, but you wouldn't go that far. Oh, yes, I would. No, not when I need you so desperately. You're really afraid, aren't you? Yes. Yes, terrified. But not of dying. Of living? Yes, without you. I know now I can't go on living without you. Then the biggest help I could be to you would be to kill you. But I, I couldn't do that now. It would be ungrateful of me. Uh, ungrateful? Yes. You, you see, doctor, you... You've cured me. Of what? Of you. But, but I need you. That, my dear Werner, is your problem. Well, I see my hour is nearly up. You're not leaving me. Yes. But you can't. No, you can't. Oh, yes, I can. 
You are no longer my doctor, my father, my lover, or my god. You're just a frightened little man. Ruth. Please, Ruth. Ruth. Oh, I might as well leave this gun with you. I have no further use for it. Good luck, Miner. <laughs> Suspense, in which Miss Nina Foch and Mr. Helmut Danteen starred in Head Shrinker, written, produced, and directed by William N. Robeson. The nurse was played by Florence Hawksworth. In just a moment, a word about next week's story of Suspense. Of all reading filters, cigarettes, Kent filters best, Kent filters best, it makes good sense. When you smoke Kent, Kent filters best. Of all of the brands of cigarettes, Kent tastes the best. Kent tastes the best. A richer taste than all the rest. Kent filters best. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with James and Pamela Mason in The Dealings of Mr. Markham. Another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. This is the CBS Radio Network.